Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is a podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we are going to talk about one of the best teams from basketball's first 50 years, the Philadelphia Spas. Now the word SPA is an acronym. It's actually the letters S-P-H-A, and that stands for the South Philadelphia Hebrew Association. And they were one of the great teams from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. During their existence, they played in many different leagues, even playing in multiple leagues at the same time. They also played some independent games like a regular barnstorming team would. But along with some of the other great teams of their era, like the original Celtics and the Harlem Globetrotters, the Spas need to be remembered for their accomplishments during the early days of basketball, before the establishment of the NBA. The story of their founding is actually kind of heartwarming. The team was started by some schoolboys who wanted to play together and compete in some local youth leagues. They originally called themselves the Combine Club. And I mean, these boys were around 11 or 12 years old when they put this team together. They played under the name Combine Club for about four or five years until they graduated from high school. But then they wanted to continue playing together beyond high school. But that meant playing against adults. They were now too old for youth leagues. So they decided to reorganize the Combine Club into something new. So three of the lead players got together and formed an adult amateur team that would play against other local teams in the Philadelphia area. The three teams were named Huey Black, Harry Passan, and Eddie Gottlieb. Passan was one of the original founders of the Combine Club when he was 11 years old. Black and Gottlieb joined the team later, but helped Passan to form this new version of the team. Now the name Eddie Gottlieb might ring a bell for those of you who are serious basketball history aficionados. Gottlieb would become the founding owner of the Philadelphia Warriors of the NBA. They won the championship during the NBA's very first season. He is also responsible for drafting Will Chamberlain. Eventually, he sold the team to new owners who moved the team to California where they now play as the Golden State Warriors. But this isn't a story about the Warriors. This is a story about the Spas. So the three teammates of Black, Passan, and Gottlieb formed the new team but they needed a sponsor to help pay for uniforms and some other basic expenses. Seeing as the players were all Jewish, they made an arrangement with the Young Men's Hebrew Association of South Philadelphia. The YMHA was just like the YMCA, except it was for Jewish men, not Christian men. But the association was willing to help sponsor the team for these teenage amateurs. In exchange, the team would call itself the YMHA and they would wear the letters YMHA on their jerseys and they were very happy to do so. Now the first season was underwhelming. They played in a league called the American League of Philadelphia, which was a local Philadelphia league that only featured six teams. The YMHA finished the season with four wins against 11 losses, which was tied for last place. Due to their poor showing, The YMHA pulled their sponsorship and the boys had to go looking for another sponsor. So they approached one of the other community organizations in town called the South Philadelphia Hebrew Association. This organization, just like the YMHA, was a group that fostered and promoted Jewish culture among the large Jewish population in South Philadelphia. 
Well, they provided uniforms for that second season as long as the team was willing to rename itself the Spas. And they would display the letters SPHA in Hebrew letters on the jerseys. But after just a couple of seasons, they then lost the sponsorship of the South Philadelphia Hebrew Association. The association decided that the sponsorship money was better spent with some other projects within the community. But this time, the players didn't need to go searching for another sponsor. The three teenagers were no longer teenagers. They were now business owners. They opened the PGB Sporting Goods Shop, with PGB standing for Passan, Gottlieb, and Black. Now that they owned a sporting goods store, they became their own sponsors, designing and providing their own uniforms. However, they kept the name Spas since they were still a team made up of primarily Jewish players, and they wanted to honor that. Also, they were beginning to establish a strong basketball reputation, and they didn't want to change names at this point. They continued to play and get better as a team, but because they did not have their own home court for much of their existence, they were sometimes called the Wandering Jews. Of course, this is a reference to the fact that they had no home court, but it is also a biblical reference to the Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years after Moses led them into freedom after having spent 400 years as slaves in Egypt. If you've ever seen the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, the second half of that movie is the story of the Israelites wandering through the desert. But back to the basketball story. The Spas continued to play in the American League as well as the Manufacturers League, which was another league in Philadelphia that was comprised of teams sponsored by various factories and featured factory workers as their players. The American League was considered the major league in Philadelphia, while the Manufacturers League was considered a minor league with weaker competition. But even the American League became a minor league when the NBA arrived in Philadelphia in 1946. As the 1920s rolled on and became the 1930s, the team joined another league called the Philadelphia League. And that's when they began to win championships. The team was also a professional team at this point. They were no longer amateurs. They were starting to get paid for their basketball skills, and that made it easier for them to recruit increasingly better players and they dominated Philadelphia basketball in the 30s and into the 40s. By this point, the original teenagers that started the team were no longer playing for them, although Eddie Gottlieb stayed on and became the head coach and manager of the team. And this gave Gottlieb the chance to learn the skills of running a professional basketball team that would serve him greatly when the NBA arrived in 1946 and he jumped in with the Warriors. However, I am getting a little bit ahead of myself. So this is a great place to take a break, and I'll tell the rest of the story of the Philadelphia Spas right after this. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show. Let's get back to our story. So Gottlieb is now running the team with a new generation of players. While everyone who was into basketball knew them as the Spas, they would sometimes play under the name the Philadelphia Hebrews, since they were strictly a Jewish team. And that had its own set of problems. Being the only prominent Jewish team on the East Coast, they often had to battle anti-Semitism when they played away games. In addition to the names that they were called, which I'm not even going to repeat, they had to deal with other forms of prejudice. Sometimes they were pelted with snowballs from the opposing fans except that the snowballs had rocks hidden inside them. Sometimes opposing fans would bring signs that depicted coffins and nooses in an attempt to intimidate the players. But to their credit, whatever anger or frustration they felt, they took it out on the opposing team, and the Spas won way more often than they lost. The team also spent some time barnstorming where they defeated the original Celtics and the New York Renaissance, two of the most formidable teams of the era, if you want to know more about the New York Wrens, go back and listen to episode 2 where I share their story. The Wrens were arguably the best team of the 1920s and 30s, but the Spas were a close second. In fact, according to basketball historian Robert Peterson, the Spas might have been the only team to ever beat the Wrens on their home floor in Harlem. The Spas then set up a three-game series against the original Celtics, also from New York and the Spas won two out of those three games. And if you want to hear the story of the original Celtics, 
go back and check out episode 28. They are one of the other really great teams from the barnstorming days of basketball. Now, as we move into the 1930s, the Spas, under Gottlieb's coaching, would win the American League Championship six times as they maintained a pretty heavy barnstorming schedule. When they were not playing official league games, they would often be playing anyone they could find so they could sell tickets and make some extra money. And while we're talking about money, let's get into that topic for just a little bit. Gottlieb would pay his players by the game. They had no exclusive contracts, which meant that many of the players played for other teams when they had a night off from playing for the Spas. But Gottlieb would pay the rookies $35 per game and up to $100 per game for a star player. Now, $35 back in 1930 is about $550 today. And the $100 that they would pay a superstar back in 1930 well, that's about $1,500 today. Now, this means that most of these guys had to either have a day job in order to pay the bills, or they had to play as many games as possible for other teams in order to make up the difference and pay their bills. But also, it became physically taxing to play that many basketball games. Eventually, the spas were able to secure a permanent home court by using the ballroom of the Broadwood Hotel. And like most teams of the day, they would schedule a dance right after the game and fans would get both events for a single ticket price. And this is how it worked. Ballrooms already had a hardwood floor, so teams did not need to bring in a court. They would simply use tape to mark the boundaries, the half court line, the lane, and the free throw line. They would then set up temporary baskets at each end. They would place tables and chairs around the court where the fans would sit. And once the game was over, they would roll the baskets into the corner and a big band would quickly come out and set up for the dance. Often the players would quickly shower and dress and join the crowd for the dancing portion of the evening. At one point, the Spas had a player named Gil Fitch out of Temple University, and he had to really hurry up after the game because he was also the band leader. Now let's just say that the Spas home games were very popular with young Jewish singles as the dances were the highlight of the social calendar. And while the team mostly stuck to the northeastern cities like New York, Boston, and Washington, D.C., they would typically take one annual trip to the Midwest to play the best teams from the National Basketball League, teams like Akron, Detroit, Oshkosh, Sheboygan, and Pittsburgh. Eventually, as there were talks of forming a new professional league on the East Coast, Gottlieb would sell the Spas to a man named Red Klotz, who was a former Spas player. That new league would eventually become the NBA, and Gottlieb wanted in on it. Meanwhile, Red Klotz, the new owner of the Spas, would lead them as a regular opponent of the Harlem Globetrotters. And that was a very lucrative arrangement. Klotz was friends with the owner of the Globetrotters, Abe Saperstein. The arrangement for the two teams to tour together was a good one for several reasons. By the beginning of the 1950s, the NBA was starting to become more popular and was attracting the best talent coming out of college. Barnstorming teams were not as popular as they used to be. And this led to barnstorming teams having a harder time selling tickets. These teams were struggling financially, and many were starting to go out of business. Basically, teams like the Globetrotters and the Spas had fewer and fewer opponents to play against. And the teams that were available were very weak and really not worth playing. So the Spas and the Globetrotters really needed each other. And the Spas became willing to let the Globetrotters go through their comedy routines without interfering. Starting in 1952, Klotz began to have the Spas play under a new name to add variety to the Globetrotters game. The new name was the Washington Generals. As the team became less and less Jewish, he would retire the name Philadelphia Spas in 1959. But technically, the organization still lives on as the Washington Generals. And the story of the Washington Generals is one that I am going to share in about three weeks. So I have that episode already in the works. But this is basically the end of the team that we know as the Philadelphia Spas. They had an absolutely incredible 30-year run as one of the best teams from the first 50 years of the game's history. And it is very nice to know that a team started by a group of 11-year-old boys in 1910 is still playing basketball today. I'm sure that if they knew that their youth team would still be around over 100 years later, that they would have never believed it. 
But that is a true story of the Philadelphia Spas. And that's it for today. Join us next week when I share the story of Allen Iverson's deadly crossover and the man who taught it to him. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. Also, I'll announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. And don't forget to check out SportsHistoryNetwork.com for more information on my podcast and the rest of the podcasts on the network. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.